In late August, the relatively unknown West Nile virus hit the headlines. Fox News reported that none other than Dr. Anthony Fauci had been diagnosed with the virus. But never fear, as the 83-year-old is expected to make a full recovery. This was reminiscent of early 2020 when Hollywood A-lister Tom Hanks announced with much fanfare that he had COVID-19. We covered that story in our latest book, The Final Pandemic, noting the trend of celebrity cases inserted into the opening ceremonies of fake pandemics. And just like when COVID-19 was launched, the Fox News story went on to report that there is currently no vaccine for West Nile virus. Now, I could insert a meme here about whether the public will buy into this one more time, but instead, I'll let Tony take it away. Tell it to me one more time I can never hear enough While I got you near oh, Say those words again Like you just did Oh baby Tell it to me once again This morning, heading into the long holiday weekend, there are new concerns buzzing for those eager to soak up the final days of summer outside. We've had a lot of extra rain, so there's a lot of mosquitoes around. Rare but potentially deadly mosquito-borne illnesses continue to plague parts of the country. It's crazy just you're sitting on like my back porch for 10 minutes and then I, I go back inside and I've got like 10 bites. Wisconsin officials announcing two deaths linked to West Nile virus, making for nearly two dozen deaths nationwide, with nearly 300 cases reported in 33 states. And now there's a sixth case of Eastern Equine Encephalitis, or Triple E, the virus found in five states that's killed one man. I think it's going to be um, a significant concern in the future. Cities taking action, spraying neighborhoods to help protect residents. For those heading to a lake for Labor Day, be on high alert. Mosquitoes look for still fresh water and be sure to apply a deep based insect repellent on top of your sunscreen. We'll stop at this point of the marketing campaign as they hit the public call to action step. This involves spreading chemicals on the skin and then adding another layer of chemicals on top of that one. You can watch my video, Does Sunscreen Cause Cancer?, which outlines why you should avoid putting some of these compounds on your body. Many of our regular audience will have noticed how many themes came up in this West Nile virus fear porn extravaganza, aired by the Today Show on the 31st of August. Firstly, warnings are issued about being outside in the sun. Watch out because such a risky activity could lead to sickness or even your complete demise. Next, they explain that this is because disease and death-dealing aerial attack weapons in the form of mosquitoes are ready to strike at any moment. For good measure, sprinkle on a sentence about unusual weather or climate change to infer how this diabolical situation has arisen. I have covered the mosquito blame game in some of my previous videos, including those on yellow fever, dengue fever and the ongoing DDT cover-up. As we have pointed out, almost every region in the world has mosquitoes. Most of us are bitten every year, and yet virtually none of us get these alleged specific diseases. We have also been contacted by people who have lived and worked in the tropics for years and do not get any of these diseases, as they do not share all of the same living conditions as those who are getting sick. There are other factors at work, such as nutritional deficiencies and environmental poisoning. Hence, the mosquitoes are not the independent variable, and even if they were, that does not equate to evidence of any viruses, as I have explained in those previous videos. Back to the Fox News coverage, and the screen is peppered with the graphic 300 cases in 33 states. Interesting numbers, and could be by chance. We'll make note of it and leave it at that, because as our friend Steve Falconer would say, that's none of my business. Next up are the officials, quote, protecting residents by spraying chemicals in their neighbourhoods. Similar to some of the scenes we saw coming out of China in 2020, this is an effective scare tactic and makes it look like only the top brass are capable of managing the situation. Is this a joke? Of course, it's all perfectly natural to claim that they need to kill dangerous germs and insects 
And the best way to do that is by dousing people in their neighborhoods with chemicals. The public health mavens sure know how to create a healthy environment for the whole family. We are told that all signals point to the need for these communities to be on high alert. Never mind that many more people are being killed in road traffic accidents in the United States. We need to keep our focus on the alleged West Nile virus situation. The Today Show then moves its coverage to an alleged victim of West Nile virus. In Missouri, John Proctor wishes his family had known about the danger of mosquito-borne illnesses sooner. His 18-year-old son, known as BB, has a long road to recovery. He's on a ventilator, paralyzed from the neck down after contracting West Nile virus from a mosquito bite his dad believes he got while playing with their dog in the backyard. While this is clearly an extremely sick young man, the cause of how he entered this condition is based on pure speculation. This is in the form of his father's guess that he got bitten by a mosquito while playing in the backyard. So now that you have seen what the corporate media are promoting, let me show you the problems with the state of the science behind the whole West Nile virus story. The CDC's website tells us that an estimated 70 to 80% of human West Nile virus infections are subclinical or asymptomatic. So even if they could find an actual virus, we have a violation of Koch's first postulate, which states, the microorganism must be found in abundance in all organisms suffering from the disease, but should not be found in healthy organisms. Many of you will be aware of how there are no logical principles holding up germ theory, and instead the proponents have inserted unfalsifiable clauses, such as healthy people being described as infected. The CDC go on to state, Most symptomatic persons experience an acute systemic febrile illness that often includes headache, weakness, myalgia or arthralgia, gastrointestinal symptoms, and a transient maculopapular rash also are commonly reported. Less than 1% of infected persons develop neuroinvasive disease, which typically manifests as meningitis, encephalitis, or acute flaccid myelitis. So apart from the neuroinvasive picture, which is rare, so-called infection with West Nile virus can only be said to be a non-specific febrile illness, like many others. This is also apparent in the CDC's section regarding the clinical assessment, which states, Routine clinical laboratory studies are generally non-specific. In patients with neuroinvasive disease, cerebrospinal fluid examination generally shows lymphocytic pleocytosis, but neutrophils may predominate early in the course of illness. In other words, in the majority of, quote, cases, there is nothing to point to a specific disease. Only in a tiny minority are some changes in the cerebrospinal fluid found, but this increase in white cells could be seen with any inflammatory state in the fluid. Things are not looking good for them here, but the CDC make an attempt to define this as a specific condition in the section Clinical Testing and Diagnosis for West Nile Virus Disease. The main diagnostic test is claimed to be one for West Nile Virus antibodies. This actually means they have a biochemical laboratory assay that reacts to a protein that is said to be present in body fluids as a result of a response to the claimed virus. We have covered the non-specific nature of these assays, including in our book, Virus Mania, my video series of the Perth groups Yin and Yang of HIV, and other videos such as Alpha-Gal Syndrome. For the most comprehensive resource debunking the antibody hypothesis, we recommend Mike Stone's articles on the Viral IG website. Suffice to say here is that antibodies cannot be used to determine the existence of a virus. The virus needs to be shown to exist first. Additionally, positive antibody assays can be said to be no more than the detection of, or at least an increased amount of a protein class that relates to an inflammatory and or healing response in the organism. One of the biggest fallacies in the medical system is that such assays define a specific disease. We then get to the final stand when it comes to the CDC's other alleged diagnostic test. Their information for clinicians states that viral cultures and tests to detect viral RNA, e.g. RT-PCR, can be performed on serum, CSF and tissue specimens that are collected early in the course of illness, and if results are positive, can confirm an infection. In order to address this claim, we will go back to the pivotal paper that claimed to isolate the West Nile virus. It is titled, 
a neurotropic virus isolated from the blood of a native of Uganda and was published in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine in 1941. The authors state that an African woman aged 37 years was seen by one of us in December 1937 at Omago West Nile District, northern province of Uganda. Her oral temperature was 100.6 degrees Fahrenheit. She denied feeling ill, perhaps to avoid hospitalisation. And that's all we are given in terms of the clinical picture. An African woman in a destitute area that presented with a fever. So how did they determine she had a virus? They took some of her blood serum and then injected it directly into the brains of mice. As a result, they reported that of the 10 mice inoculated with the original blood serum of this woman, only one survived. The others became ill six to eight days after inoculation and either died or were sacrificed for sub-inoculations. In the next sentence, they declare that this means they had a, quote, infectious agent. And two sentences after that, the word virus suddenly appears. If you were paying attention, you would be asking them, where is the virus? Firstly, they were injecting foreign biological material into another organism's body, which always comes with the risk of a severe reaction. Secondly, nothing was isolated from the serum, let alone a claimed specific entity such as a virus. Thirdly, how could the process be described as infectious? Injecting material directly into an animal's brain is not something that happens in nature. At least they acknowledged later in the paper that with regard to the mode by which the virus is transmitted, little is known. Experimental investigations have been made to ascertain whether it may be transmitted in mice by contact. Thus far, the results have been negative. It should be pointed out here that the researchers were funded by the Rockefeller Institute, an organisation that supported many experiments of this type last century, and one that played a pivotal role in the establishment of virology and the vaccine industry. The authors found the serum could also kill rhesus monkeys if they injected it directly into their brains, but on the other hand, it only induced a fever in African monkeys subjected to the same insult. Finally, they tried injections into the brains of rabbits, guinea pigs and hedgehogs, none of which exhibited any signs of illness at all. It's unclear how this works on their own terms. Apparently, if the animal becomes unwell, then the imagined virus has infected them, and this confirms its existence. On the other hand, if the animal remains well, then they are not susceptible to the imagined virus, and this also confirms its existence. This is a ridiculous and unfalsifiable paradigm, in which the existence of the virus has been declared in advance. The pseudoscience was also evident due to the lack of controls. When it came to an alleged virus, there was no way to control the experiments due to their inability to identify an independent variable in the form of viral particles. A valid control would require them to repeat the injections into the animal's brains with the same mixture, except with the claimed infectious particles removed. This is the foundational flaw that exposes the entire virus model. Variants are not found in nature and then experimented with. Instead, they are imagined in advance, and all subsequent observations are made to fit the model. As my husband Mark outlined in his essay, Virus, Bacteriophage, and Single Virus Genomics, even the very definition of virus has been a shifting notion within the world of virology. As such, I should point out here that the authors of the 1941 publication would not necessarily have conceptualized their supposed virus in the modern sense. While the word control did appear in the paper several times, this was only in the form of neutralization tests, where not only was the existence of the virus assumed, but also the existence of supposed binding antibodies in the serum of humans and animals. They continue their fallacious thinking, involving assumptions in advance about the constituents of the samples. The conclusions they draw about immunity is thus pure speculation, as there were far too many variables involved. However, this is all a distraction from the pivotal issue, and that is, they never showed a virus to begin with. So how is it that the CDC claimed to have a PCR test that detects sequences from an entity they are calling West Nile Virus? In 1999, a key paper was published in Science Journal claiming to have discovered its 11,029 nucleotide genome. In the methodology, it states that 
They took a brain sample from a Chilean flamingo that had died in the Bronx Zoo. The sample was added to an embryonated chicken egg for, quote, viral isolation, and four days later, quote, flabby virus-like particles, diameter 40 nanometers, were observed by electron microscopy. This is simply a point-and-declare exercise, with the CDC publishing images such as these and claiming the apparent vesicles are variants, even though their biological function is unknown in these tissue breakdown experiments. No evidence is provided that they are infectious, disease-causing particles. In summary, the detected genetic sequences can only be said to come from a flamingo brain and an embryonated chicken-egg cocktail. So here is some of the key evidence that has been cobbled together to make it look like a West Nile virus exists. In 1937, a destitute 37-year-old Ugandan woman with a fever and no other symptoms is arbitrarily decided to have a new disease. The virus hunters declare they have found a new virus when her blood is injected into the brains of mice and decimates them although it is admitted that they don't know how that would work in nature. The supposedly specific disease is said to be asymptomatic in three quarters of, quote, cases, has non-specific symptoms in others, and is only dangerous with more specific symptoms in a tiny proportion. The main diagnostic test is, quote, virus-specific antibodies, for which they had no virus specimen to match the test against. Then we get to the alleged PCR test, which has been designed to find sequences from mixed tissue, such as the aforementioned brew involving a flamingo's brain and a chicken egg. This test is so embarrassing that the CDC has officially stated, the likelihood of detecting a West Nile virus infection through such testing is fairly low in immunocompetent patients. There are, of course, plenty of other scientific publications that attempt to uphold the notion that there is a West Nile virus, but they start with the assumption that a virus was discovered in 1937. We would not be concerned with the fantasies of the virologists if they kept it to themselves. But unfortunately, their inventions attract the pharmaceutical industry, and the public is viewed as ripe for the picking. At present, the only licensed West Nile virus vaccines are those used on horses. Some vaccines have been administered to humans in early phase clinical trials and were declared promising due to positive antibody assays. In other words, the recipients were injured and developed an inflammatory and or healing response. For more details on this phenomenon, please watch my video, Is Immunity Real? A paper published in the journal Vaccines in May this year stated that for a human West Nile virus vaccine to reach FDA licensure, an alternate pathway to licensure would likely be required. We can already guess what this would look like in the form of the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act, or PrEP Act. As we wrote in a subchapter of the final pandemic called Stuffing Their Mouths with Gold, this act, quote, specifically affords to drug makers immunity from actions related to the manufacture, testing, development, distribution, administration, and use of medical countermeasures. It allows the United States Human and Health Services Secretary to unilaterally declare a pandemic state of emergency, but does not list any criteria for making such a declaration. The Act even allows previously banned vaccine constituents, such as thimerosal, to be brought back into use in the name of the alleged emergency situation. So if yet another vaccine comes out, we already know that it will be unsafe and ineffective. More importantly is the realisation that there is no it when it comes to West Nile virus. There is no specific disease and no virus. Individuals get sick for different reasons and working out why requires a case-by-case -case approach. Blaming it on imagined microbes only serves the fear narratives and the pharmaceutical industry, with the resulting disastrous government interventions. Stay tuned for more publications exposing virological and germ theory pseudoscience as we work out better ways to health and well-being. If you enjoyed this video, please visit supportdrsam.com.